It's Q&A time. Hey, original root boy, DJ Shaki. Well done. Now you're gonna see me from time to time look down. It's because my laptop is here, and that's where the questions are. So let's get to the first one. Okay, this was on the uh, how to get a visa video, and it says, "Excellent, thank you." Could it be done similarly in Medellin? Your laugh at the end of the video is contagious. Yes, this is a national process and so you can get it done anywhere. However, I can't vouch for what the pricing would be, but I imagine it will be fairly similar. So I wouldn't really worry too much about that. So wherever you're going to be, that's where you want to do it. You can go through an attorney or you can go through people that specialize in it. And I'll post up information on the one that I used in Pareda. Uh, they're not attorneys that I'm, that I'm aware of. I mean, they may be, but uh, their office and everything they do is about getting your visa. And this next one, again, is on the visa video. This confirms what I've read recently by another site, by someone who has also gone through the process and reported their experience. Well, I know there's a question here somewhere. About halfway down, it says, one other issue I read conflicting info on is taxes on income, whether it's in country or from outside of Colombia, of which social security would be part of, according to some. And you spoke of a value added tax on certain goods, but is there uh, income tax? All right, this is a legal question. I'm going to give you what applies to me, and I know one, two, seven people in Colombia in a similar situation on a retirement visa. So I will speak to that particular category. There's income tax pretty much everywhere you go. The question is, do you fit it? Do you reach a threshold? If you're retired, Social Security is not income. This is something that I argued in Ecuador. It's not an income. You're not being paid. It's essentially the equivalent of, and we can argue whether it's being treated like that, but what it's supposed to be, it represents a savings account. You paid in throughout your life and now you receive back plus interest. That's what it's supposed to be. It's what it was designed to be. It's not income, you're not working for it. That was all done in the past. You paid in. It doesn't represent your labor, it represents what you put into it. Columbia recognizes that. They don't see it as income either. Now there are thresholds, so I can't speak to every situation, but I know of one of the retirees that retired on through Social Security about $2,000 a month. He has no tax on that. Most people retire, from what I understand, around 14, 1500, 1200 in that range. And none of those people have tax on it. Where the tax comes into play is if you have income that you're making in Colombia, let's say you open a business and you're selling widgets and you're making money, that you're gonna be taxed on it. There are some businesses that you would have outside of the country receiving here but there's thresholds to that and so again I'm not going to speak to it because it's an accounting thing it's very it can be complicated if it were simple you wouldn't have all the conflicting information but if you don't reach a certain amount of a threshold again it's a non-issue so if you're coming to Columbia you're coming and you're retiring and you're basically living off uh, Social Security or something similar. No, there's no tax. Check, check, live it right. I know say I hides from the rebel farm, yeah. I know say one love, one aim, one destiny. Hiya, I them say more. I every pass it them a show. As for the value added tax, I can't really say any more about it than I said in the last video, so I would just refer you back to that. Okay, this next one it was really just a comment 
it's very easy now because the government has declared by law the simplification of the bureaucracy. What he's referring to is again the visa video where I was so happy that I needed so little to get it accomplished. Now this isn't a question, so why do I bring it up? I just want to juxtapose it with my prior experience. I've told you before that I was here 16 years ago or so and I was working and I met somebody and ultimately ended up getting married. I lived in Pereira for uh, some period of time and so I have pretty good experience back then when unemployment was over 50 percent, when the FARC controlled large portions of the country including between Armenia and Pereira. Um, I was here when poverty ran rampant. I was here when Medellin was basically controlled by criminals and you had to pay to go from block to block. I was also here when I had to get a visa for marriage. I had to go back to the U.S. for about a month, again work related, and then I returned. And through the course of that, we decided we were going to get married. And so at that point I needed to, in order to marry her, I had to get a marriage visa. That process was kind of a nightmare. I don't even remember all of it. I know that I had to have all kinds of relationship information. I had to have documentation of uh, certain things about relationships. I had to have uh, blood tests. I had to have not just divorce certificates, but I had to have information surrounding that. Again, it's kind of fuzzy. I just remember that I had to have dozens of documents bank account information, tons of things in order to get the visa and it took me a few months. I got the visa and it was all said and done. It was more difficult for me to get the marriage visa in those days than it was for her to get the visa to go to the United States after we were married and she was coming to the US with me. So. I can vouch for the fact firsthand the bureaucracy in those days was every bit as frustrating as what I experienced in Ecuador. It was horrific. Bureaucracy was everything. Customer service didn't exist. It is what it is and you sh shut up and take it. That was my disappointment again in Ecuador where there was that attitude. However, here now, it's night and day. Here it's customer service. It reminds me in New York, we used to have a DMV that was just the, the worst. It was the worst DMV in the world. They would intentionally cause you to wait in line. They wouldn't help you to choose what form you might need. You, when you get up to the line, if it was the wrong form, they delighted in sending you back for it, but you couldn't get, jump back in line. You had to go to the end of the line again. You had to spend half a day to get something simple done. And then someone came along that was in charge of the DMV who said, we're not gonna have this anymore. This is gonna be a customer driven organization. And things changed almost overnight. If people wouldn't give customer service, they were fired. And they replaced them with people that would give customer service. They had later hours so you could go after work. They had weekend hours. They had even Sunday hours by appointment. So if you just couldn't make it any other time, you could set up an appointment to go in, say, 2 o'clock on a Sunday, and someone would be there to meet you and take care of your business. Going to DMV became a very simple, quick process. It was a delight. And when you went up to the counter, people would smile and how was your day? Night and day. Well, that night and day is what I've experienced here in Columbia 16 years ago versus this time around. It couldn't have been simpler. And when you think about it, all of these extra things that are demanded, both historically here and currently in Cuenca or in Ecuador, those are things they don't really need. I mean, if you really think about what would be the purpose of it, there is no purpose. They don't need it, but they demand it. Here, a simple piece of cake. Next question. 
Okay, let me know the name of the company that you used. It doesn't really matter, honestly. I mean, you, there's lots of them. You can pick it. Actually, if you stop the video, you'll see the address on the building and the name of the, of the business is right there. I will see if I can find it. If I can, I will post it up here. I think for you, in your case, I ask you to send me an email so that I can reply to that email and copy and paste. I might have a copy of the business card. So I'll look for that and I'll see if I can put it um, on this video. Here's a man that watched the interview in Manizales of a person named Tom six or seven months ago, come to think of it. And he's talking about gringos flooding places and in his interview he, he was trying to escape. He'd been to lots of places, Costa Rica, he'd just been all around and he, it's like he's trying to stay ahead of the curve of where international lying promotes places and you, then you get thousands of gringos come in. Here's the issue, and Cuenca will be a bit of an exception because the people in Cuenca, I mean half of them are just normal, wonderful people, but an inordinate amount of them are just kind of whack jobs, so you, you can throw that in the mix. But what happens when you get a lot of gringos over a relatively short period of time, over the course of a handful of years, is it alters the way a place is. If it were slow and over a long period of time, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make any difference. But what happens when you have these groups of people that are flocking in, mostly ill-prepared, mostly don't have language skills, and so they, they make these enclaves, which is okay. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but they come in without knowledge. And the primary thing is you're coming into a different economy. That economy within its borders works fine. But when you introduce somebody from the outside with money uh, that is more than what that local economy is, it begins to skew how things are. It's no different than in the 70s when you had all these people from Saudi Arabia coming into the United States and buying up property at very high prices which are driving up other prices and it created all kinds of problems. And so what you find is basically two problems. Prices are artificially increased over no other way to put it, stupidity. I mean, somebody comes and they don't really know what they're doing and they say, oh, that price is great and they put it out there. And they think that has no effect. They say, well, it's just, it's good for the local population. They're just getting extra money. Not really because then somebody else looks at that and says, well, I can raise my prices. I can get that. And next thing you know, your local population is paying considerably more for things than they were before this wave arrived that causes a certain amount of resentment. It also causes local people to start looking at you like, oh, you have money to burn, so you might as well throw it my way. And they start looking at you as though you're a source of income rather than just a person. Prime example, difference between Cuenca and Armenia. In Cuenca, which has gone through this for a number of years now, it's hell to pay to get change back from your taxi. Uh, they never seem to have change, right? If you're in Cuenca, you know what I'm talking about. It just goes in the guy's pocket. Here in Armenia, they won't let you out of the cab until they've given you every last penny because they're not used to that sort of thing. And if, if they keep that, they feel like they're thieves and there's still honor and integrity that exists. It hasn't been skewed by people coming in and throwing money around like it's nothing. So those are the primary effects, but there's one other. When you get groups of gringos, first of all, what drove them to a location was profit motivated. Selling seminars and books and certain things. And then once they arrive there, you have other gringos that all of a sudden see easy marks. You have people coming in that don't know any better, so let me get a hold of them. I'm an English speaker. I can help them through these things, but they're going to pay me three times the amount. You see that a lot, again, in Cuenca in, in housing. You see so many people paying five, six hundred dollars for a property that should be 350. And they're getting screwed by their own people. 
it's so you take all of this and put it together and that's what he was referring to in that interview if you get a lot of gringos in a short period of time it corrupts that place and the, the joy and pleasure of the reason that you wanted to go there to begin with vanishes or changes Last one. Pretty good question, a little personal, but I'm going to I'm going to answer it best I can. In a couple of my videos recently, I've talked about my ex-wife to the extent of she has family here and um, they've reached out to me and as a matter of fact, uh, the niece showed up yesterday. We'll be here for probably a couple of weeks. But he he commented, you can, you can read it, he noted that I spoke with fondness of her. And because of that, is there still something going on? Is there some chance maybe we'll get back together? Well, first of all, she's not in Colombia. She, she's remarried now, has a child, is very happy, is living again as a teacher in the United States. My speaking of fondness, is because I'm very fond of her. I appreciate her. She's one of the best people in general that I've ever met in my life. She has honor. She has integrity. She would never lie. She's just a wonderful person. And I admire that. I respect that about her. We never had hard feelings. There wasn't animosity. There wasn't a big fight. I don't carry any baggage. And she's not the kind of person that would, even if there were a reason, and, and there wasn't. There is absolutely no reason for me to not look at her like in f fondness, like, like the word you use. It has nothing to do with getting back together. We, we separated and got divorced for a specific reason beyond her and me. And that hasn't changed. She now has created another life, which was part of the plan, and, and that life is a wonderful life and I'm really happy for her. I'm glad that you know she has found that success. I'm glad that she's got her dream job. She deserves it. But I've got a good friend. His name is Steven Rudek from many many years ago back in the 80s. Again one of the nicest people. Well-mannered, great temperament, very intelligent, very honest. This guy had integrity. He could pull his nails out and he, and, he, and he wouldn't lie about something. Wonderful person. Am I going to get back together with him? <laughs> no, it's a memory. I'm glad he was in my life. I'm glad he was a good friend. Um, I'm glad that we had a couple years where we got to know each other. And in her case, we were married, and we had a wonderful marriage. And I look back with fondness on the fact that those are eight years of some of the best in my life. But I've moved on, she's moved on, and we're both doing great. So I appreciate the question. I thank you. Um, no, there's absolutely zero chance that there will be any kind of reconnection like that. Okay, that's it. That's my first Q&A. My battery's going dead anyway. See you soon. Hey, original root boy, DJ Shaky, well done, John Black. Hey man, esa que quiero conocerla para que toda la noche ya conmigo pueda estar y tú en busca de otra para ti para que te divierta y podamos compartir. Hey yo danza, danza, what?